very much for taking the time out of your day to join us for our compliance and enforcement webinar. My name is Mark Fiddler um, and I'll be your host today. Before we do start, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this country and their continuing connection with land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to all traditional owners and to elders past, present and emerging. We're joining you online from Mianjin or Brisbane, which is the traditional country of the Turrbal or Yagara peoples. So as I said, my name is Mark Fiddler. Uh, I will be your host. Uh, I've been with the RTA for 19 years. Um, my current role is in our compliance, uh, sorry, in our <laughs> communication and education team. Um, and uh, we're responsible for running webinars such as this and information sessions. Um, a lot of my time has been in the contact centre. So I've got a fair bit of experience in um, in the ways that the operations of the RTA works. But more importantly, joining me today is Stuart Taylor, who's our Principal Compliance and Enforcement Officer. Morning, Stu. Morning, everyone. So, Stu, um, let us know a little bit about yourself and uh, your background with the RTA. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. So I've been with the RTA since 2017, and I've been in the Compliance and Enforcement team uh, for that time. Uh, my background is in investigations, and I've been doing uh, different forms of investigative work across uh, government agencies for roughly the last 20 years. Fantastic. So we're in good hands today, ladies and gents. So as um, you can see on the screen, there's a, a list of topics there. I won't go through each of them, but we will discuss these topics uh, as we go along uh, before answering uh, any questions that you may have for us. Uh, we would encourage you to use the chat function to um, pop your questions in to uh, the chat and we'll uh, get to those uh, later on in the, pre in the presentation. Uh, to those of you that uh, submitted questions through the registration process, uh, we've either included them as a part of the presentation or we will get to them at the end of the presentation as well. So, and just a reminder that we can't discuss individual cases today uh, due to customer privacy and today's session is for general guidance and not for legal advice. So now I will hand over to Stu to talk to you about our priority areas. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, so our priority areas uh, relate to um, some of the pillars of the RTA and, and the work that we do, uh, the communication and education team, uh, the customer experience division, and also the compliance and enforcement team, um, and how we all work together to um, deliver a renting that's fair for everyone across Queensland. So the compliance, uh, sorry, the communication and education team uh, do a lot of educational work about tenancy rights and responsibilities, and that's via multiple um, platforms as well. It can be via email, websites, uh, webinars, similar to the one that's run today, uh, publications and other sorts of media. And also stakeholder engagement is a real key piece of that work that happens in that area. Um, hearing back from the sector, learning the insights um, what's working, uh, where, there's, where there's issues across the rental sector and, and how we can um, address those um, appropriately as well. Uh, the Customer Experience Division um, handle a significant number of phone calls every day. Uh, they take over 1,400 phone calls a day and they work through uh, the tenant's rights and responsibilities. And that has a really great flow and effect for the rest of the business where a customer is able to ring up and find out the right information and the best way to manage their tenancy so that other issues um, throughout the tenancy don't arise, uh, in including a reduction in the number of investigation cases we receive because that tenant or that landlord or that agent has been given the right information in the first instance. Um, so they're a vital part of what we do here at the RTA. And then there's a dispute resolution um, team as well. It's a free and confidential service that the RTA runs. Uh, and their role is to bring together parties and we will always um, promote self-resolution between the parties where possible. But when that isn't, um, we have a great team of dispute resolution uh, members that are able to conciliate between the parties. <clears throat> Now, alongside that as well as the compliance and enforcement team, our role here at the compliance and enforcement team is ensuring that there's good regulation across the rental sector, um, that the rights and responsibilities of a tenant and a, a landlord and a lesser are met, uh, and to ensure that where there is non-compliance, we take appropriate and also effective action, uh, and that action results in good compliance moving forward. Um, now, we do that through uh, a series of different ways. We uh, investigate uh, complaints as they come in and we receive those from multiple different areas. It may be directly from a tenant 
landlord or agent, um, we may have a referral come through to us from a tenancy advocacy group. We also receive information from stakeholders uh, and members of the public, and we may proactively investigate a matter or take another compliance activity in regards to information that we receive. Uh, and then we deliver um, various enforcement outcomes based off those uh, investigations and those compliance activities that we undertake. Another key area that we work in is uh, alongside our other regulators within the rental sector, um, it's not just the RTA in this space, there's multiple regulators across Queensland um, that all contribute towards uh, the renting experience for our customers. And last year, the RTA uh, established a group, the Queensland Rental Accommodation Regulators Group, and that consists of other key regulators and local councils right across Queensland. Uh, we meet quarterly and discuss at an operational level uh, good ways to drive compliance across the sector um, and, and discuss um, as, as well ways that we can assist each other with driving that compliance. Information is key in that space. And a good example would be that the RTA now undertakes uh, compliance monitoring with repair orders that are issued through QCAT, where there may be an issue in relation to the state of a rental property. Now, other agencies and other councils may have their customers make a complaint to them about the condition of the property. So we've provided those councils and those other agencies with our RTA fact sheet that runs through what a customer can do uh, in that instance and how the RTA can assist and so that's an example of how we share that information across those other agencies as well, so that when they have a customer come to them, they're aware of what we do and how we can assist them. Fantastic. Thank you very much for filling us in on all of that. So the action plan, Stu, um, was released in 2024. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what it entails and what we're looking at with regards to this? Absolutely, yes. We're very excited with this compliance and enforcement action plan um, that commenced uh, at the end of last year and rolled out at, at the beginning of 2024. It's been going very well for us uh, and we've seen some, some great improvements in uh, the way that we are as assessing and um, processing our investigation cases. We've really streamlined that process. We've made a lot of efficiencies in that space also, very importantly, we've made it clear to those that we are regulating um, what our expectation is for them in regarding being compliant with the legislation uh, and the pathways and the enforcement options uh, that, that then come to fruition if there is non-compliance in that space. So we now have a very clear uh, list of enforcement outcomes in relation to how we uh, drive those how we drive compliance. And we've also taken significant feedback from uh, the rental sector, from stakeholders, uh, from tenancy advocacy groups and other advocacy groups. And we've put together a list of key offences. Those key offences are ones that we see where there is um, uh, a trending of that offence. It's something that carries significant impact for the rental sector, either for uh, tenants' rights and responsibilities or for an issue uh, that may involve an agent. Uh, and, and some of those have been quite topical of, of recent um, the rent increase within the last 12 months, repair orders, um, and also rent that's not advertised at a fixed price as well. So these are offences that we know through feedback that we receive um, are key for the rental sector at the moment. And so we're looking to address those specifically. Um, and we also target uh, other offences such as unlawful entry and non-lodgement of bond, which traditionally um, have had a high representation in the number of complaints that we receive. And we also understand the significance um, that those um, breaches may have on the parties involved in a tenancy. So the Compliance and Enforcement Action Plan, and we'll have a slide later that will really show the results of that action plan since it's come into place and, and the great steps that we've taken um, with those enforcement outcomes this year. Um, but that Compliance and Enforcement Action Plan really drives the work that we do. It underpins where we're looking to make effective use of the resources that we have in our team um, to target those areas that are significant for the sector. And that's based off the feedback that we get from the sector. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Stu. So in relation, you talked about uh, outcomes. Um, so we've looked at the big picture of influence in the sector. Um, so what are we seeing? How many investigations are we doing? What are our numbers like? So 
from uh, financial year to date, from July 1 last year through until the end of a uh, April this year, uh, 2024, we've received 295 investigation requests and we've closed 248 cases during that time as well. Now, we've issued 138 notices of non-compliance and 29 penalty infringement notices. And a little bit of information about what a notice of non-compliance is. If there is a, a breach of the legislation, we receive that complaint or we proactively investigate that and we substantiate that breach, we, we look at the outcomes that we may deliver. Now, where the breach is proven, we will issue that notice of non-compliance. And this goes back to that action plan. We, we make it very clear to that individual or that agency um, that that breach, we have identified it. It is a breach of legislation and therefore we are taking action. We will issue a notice of non-compliance and make it clear that if Further breaches are established, we will consider other enforcement options, which include a penalty infringement notice or a prosecution. And as you can see, uh, year to date, we have issued 29 penalty infringement notices. That's where a monetary fine is uh, issued, um, similar to a, uh, a, a ticket that you might receive, um, which, which has a fine attached to it um, in relation to that breach that they've received. We've also commenced two prosecutions this year as well, and that's where we take an individual or an agency uh, to the local criminal magistrate's court um, where they answer the alleged breach. Both of those prosecutions arose um, from two of the penalty infringement notices that we issued. Uh, the person or individual that's issued that notice can elect to have the matter taken to court instead. And where they make that election, we then follow through and we will then prosecute through the local magistrate's court where that's heard. Um, in relation to the 24 penalty infringement notices that we have issued this year, 14 of those have come off our proactive investigations where we've uh, targeted issues uh, such as advertising for no fixed price. Um, and so that also shows some of that proactive work that we're doing. In addition to the complaints that we receive from the community, we also proactively investigate through information that we hold or from feedback that we receive. And from that, you can see that we have been taking action in relation to uh, eight penalty infringement notices issued so far. We're always interested to make sure that we are addressing trending offences within the rental sector. And we know those at the moment to be unlawful entry, non-lodgement of bond, failure to keep the documentation and the agreement terms breach. Also false misleading information is a trending offence for us at the moment. So we ensure that the activities that we undertake um, are addressing those concerns that uh, the rental community are feeling at the moment. Thanks for that, Stu. So just a quick question, are these investigations and notices publicly available? We do um, provide information in the uh, annual report that comes out each year and other information is uh, available uh, through other various working groups. In relation to publication of, of those uh, particular figures, that, that would be something that uh, is, is driven through um, reporting that the RTA puts together at a whole, as a whole um, towards the end of each year. So as I said at the start, uh, we can't talk about individual cases. Certainly we can look mm -hmm. at the numbers side of things, but we wouldn't be providing detail around specifics and uh, individual cases and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's that's correct. We are, we've identif de-identified the information so that we can speak to the actions that we've been taking without um, specifically calling out any particular agency or individual involved. Yep. Fantastic. All right. So you spoke... When you spoke about the action plans, you mentioned uh, repair orders uh, and as a new offence. So we're aware minimum housing standards uh, are a focus coming up to the 1st of September where all properties uh, or all premises must meet minimum housing standards. Now, obviously, if repairs aren't done, a tenant can apply to, to QCAT for a repair order. Uh, and the process there, um, if the, the tenant uh, is unable to establish uh, or, or get repairs done, that would not only bring the property back to minimum housing standards, but any repair, they then ta uh, can take the matter uh, through dispute resolution and then if it's not resolved off to the tribunal. So as you can see there on the screen, some different outcomes uh, or orders are made by QCAT. So in regards to the compliance and enforcement side of things, Stu, what, uh, what's our involvement or what's compliance and enforcement's involvement with this particular process? Yes, yeah, so when the uh, when the adjudicator or magistrate at QCAT grants a repair order, um, 
they, the parties that are listed on that order, the applicant and also the respondent, um, receive a copy of that order. The RTA also receives a copy of that order. The compliance and enforcement team then notify, uh, we send com written communication out to both of those parties, advising them that we have a copy of the order and also advising them that the order needs to be complied with. If it's not complied with, it is an offence that the RPA investigates and it was an offence um, that was added specifically in relation to repair orders. So when there is a breach of the repair order, if the repair order is not completed within the time that's stipulated on the order or if the repair is, is not completed um, at all, it, it may be a breach. And when it is a breach, uh, we will investigate. So what we do, we provide that information to both the parties. We um, provide them with information telling them uh, what their rights and responsibilities are, what the pathways that are open to them are if they feel that they may not be able to complete the order within time and a need to return to QCAT to resolve that. And that at the end of the time listed on the order for that repair to be completed, if it's not done, uh, we we are, may receive an investigation request and we will follow through in relation to taking action. Fantastic. Just whilst, uh, sorry, just quickly whilst we're on that particular point as well, it is important to note as well, in a QCAT repair order application, um, to try and list both um, the, the agency and the owner in relation to those repairs as well, um, to to get the most effect from the repair order. If, if the, the tenant or the applicant is looking for a specific repair to be done, if they know the details of the landlord for that property to ensure that they also list them as uh, one of the parties to that application when they make it. So that's to ensure that the uh, agent's not left holding the, uh, the responsibility in that situation. That's right, because the responsibility also lies with the landlord and if it isn't specifically to undertake a repair. Uh, good tip. Thanks for that. All right. Um, so obviously we've talked about the process. Um, how can people report uh, things that need to, or they think that they need to uh, have investigated? Yes. Yeah, so we've just recently updated our webpage, which now includes uh, a, a link that, uh, and a document that individuals can go into if they wish to report to the RTA a property that they believe is not meeting standard, um, it may not meet the minimum housing standard and in need of repair, uh, you can go online and anonymously submit um, those concerns to us. That will come through to the compliance and enforcement team where we then engage um, with the managing party and or the lessor in relation to those concerns um, and we can provide some information uh, and empower them to understand what their rights and responsibilities are as a landlord and as a property manager and uh, what avenues they can take so that that property does meet standard. Excellent. So there's you'll see a link uh, on the website there to that uh, updated um, form. I'll also drop it into the chat so uh, people can, can click straight into that. Um, so just uh, with that, Stu, so obviously um, the website provides the ability to put an investigation request through. Um, mm -hmm. People can use this new form. Um, from the proactive compliance side of things, um, obviously, these aren't the only ways of um, us following up. I think you mentioned earlier that we can get information from others and, and that we do some co uh, some proactive work as well. Yes, that's right. We, we greatly value when we receive information um, that can assist us with compliance work and compliance activities. Um, and we do receive that from a multitude of different um, avenues as well. Um, traditionally, we will receive an investigation request, but we often uh, receive feedback um, through stakeholders, we receive feedback through advocacy groups. Uh, and this is another tool um, that's added to that toolkit now as well, where an individual can, can get online and anon anonymously um, report where they believe there's non-compliance. Um, it is also important to remember, however, that that is an anonymous tip. So if you do put a submission through on that new web page, uh, you're unable to get feedback from us directly in relation to what action was taken. No worries at all. So once we've got uh, a request, what's the process, Stu? How do we go about following these things up? So if you submit an investigation request to the RTA, the compliance and enforcement team will receive it and we will do an initial case assessment. We will let you know that we've received your complaint and, and that we're actioning it. 
And the first thing that happens with that investigation request is we have a look to ensure that it is a tenancy that falls under the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act. And so it is, is something that we can regulate, something that we can investigate as well. So that initial case assessment, what we're looking for is to say, yes, this is a tenancy that falls under the relevant laws. Um, and this does relate to um, offences uh, that we can investigate or alleged breaches. And when I say offences or alleged breaches, um, there's several sections of the Act, uh, the RTRA Act, um, which carry penalty provisions. Uh, an example of that is Section 202, uh, the Rules of Entry. Now, you'll see there that it states there's a penalty provision if those rules aren't followed. Uh, that means that it's uh, an offence if it's breached and that the uh, compliance and enforcement team can investigate it. Now, there's other sections of the Act that don't specifically have a penalty provision attached, and that may be because it provides other avenues such as uh, going to QCAT if there is a breach. We don't specifically investigate those matters. So that initial case assessment is looking for two things. Firstly, that we have a relevant tenancy and also that we have um, matters that we can investigate. We will then contact the tenant and we'll contact uh, witnesses as, as well in relation to that investigation request. And that point where gathering as much information and evidence as we can, understanding the scope of what's occurred during that tenancy, um, understanding what, what has happened is very important for us and putting forward um, an allegation to the other party, which we do in writing regarding what those alleged breaches are. When we do put that allegation letter forward, uh, we provide the other party with an opportunity to respond. They may choose to respond in writing. They may choose to do an interview um, with the RTA as well and put forward their version of events in relation to what happened. It is very important to remember that the RTA is impartial. We are not working for either the tenant or the landlord or the agent. Uh, we are impartial. So when it comes to investigation, what we're looking for is to establish whether or not a breach has occurred and, and that's the angle that we take. And so we gather all the information, all the evidence from both parties and give them a fair opportunity to put all that information forward. And then at the end of that, we assess all of the evidence that we've received. When we do that assessment, we're looking to determine whether or not we can substantiate a breach of the section of the Act. Now, if a breach is not substantiated, we don't take further action in, in relation to that. When the breach is substantiated, we then look at what um, outcome we should deliver. What we're looking to deliver is an outcome uh, that's proportionate to the event, uh, proportionate to the circumstances, but also is going to drive compliance moving forward. We want to ensure that that outcome is going to result in a better renting experience um, for future tenants and for future agents as well. And so we take into consideration the public interest test when determining what course of action to take. Uh, and some sections of the public interest test um, involve the level of harm to the parties that were involved, whether or not that harm was to a vulnerable person, um, whether or not the actions were deliberate and dishonest, and also whether or not there's any mitigating circumstances um, in regards to why that event happened as well, what previous interactions has been with the RTA in terms of non-compliance in the past, and we're looking to see whether or not there's a likelihood of reoccurrence of that sort of offending behaviour occurring again. So we take all that into consideration uh, to what is a public expectation of the best outcome in those circumstances. And when the um, uh, breach is substantiated, we have three different potential outcomes. We have a notice of non-compliance, which very clearly articulates what the breach is, what our expectation is moving forward so that that party is compliant in future, and that if they are not compliant in future, we may consider further enforcement actions such as a penalty infringement notice or a prosecution. So a very thorough process gets followed. Appreciate that, Stu, for filling us in there. So in regards to um, putting all of that together, um, what information is important when someone does make a complaint? What can they do or provide to us to give us the best chance at a successful outcome? Yeah, so what we want is as much information that's relevant as possible. Um, if in doubt, send the information through. Um, we, we would like to see it. We would like to assess it. And again, it's important to remember that the RTA compliance enforcement team, we're impartial when, when we investigate a matter. We're investigating the breach, whether or not that breach is substantiated. So 
Firstly, the timing of the report. Um, receiving the, the information in a timely manner uh, does assist us with investigating that, particularly if there's third parties, witnesses to speak to and their recollection that they that they have of that event as well. So where possible, re receiving a report in a timely manner allows us the best chance to ensure that we gather as much evidence as we can. And the next point is the level of detail to provide um, in that investigation request that's sent through as well. Uh, an example would be, again, bringing back to uh, Section 202, an unlawful entry allegation. Now, if the allegation involves an entry notice um, that was issued and the proper time provisions having not been followed um, for that entry notice, providing the RTA not only with the copy of the entry notice that was received, but also the email that shows the time and the date that the entry notice was sent is really valuable for us to being able to determine whether or not there is a breach there. So where this communication between the parties and notices uh, are provided, Providing us with that actual communication means, if it's an email or other form, um, can be really valuable as well. Uh, if it was a, a non-lodgement of bond matter, for example, and um, you received a receipt in relation to having paid the bond, um, providing us with a copy of that receipt um, assists us as well. Providing us with any emails or, or other correspondence regarding that bond matter as well is really important. Fantastic. So I'll just drop a couple of... Uh things in here so everyone can see the bits and pieces that uh, are important. So yeah. I'll so just moving. talk to that last point as well quickly. Sorry, Mark, as, as well. And, and that is in relation to when a tenancy ends, um, you may find if you're the tenant and you wish to submit an investigation request to the RTA, um, that your access to some of the documentation that you would have been able to access during the tenancy is removed. For example, um, and you can see there the tenant ledger um, that you may have had access to through a third party application whilst the tenancy was active, um, you will no longer be able to receive that. So if you can obtain that information um, before you submit your investigation request, that's really handy. Photographs of the property as well is, is, um, is very, uh, can greatly assist us. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Stu. So just uh, as most of you be aware, our dispute we have a dispute resolution service and most of you will be aware of it. Um, we'll just have a quick look at this and how the dispute process is different from the compliance path. So Stu, if you could just uh, run through that for us a bit. Yep. So the RTA offers a, a free dispute resolution service. It's a really great tool uh, for being able to resolve a lot of disputes um, between parties in a tenancy. And that dispute resolution service um, may also involve a matter that one of those parties which wishes to make an investigation request about. Now, it's important to understand that the dispute resolution team and the compliance and enforcement team, we're very separate teams. And we, whilst we both work for the RTA, a lot of our work that we do is independent of each other and, and for, for good reason. Um, when a dispute resolution matter happens, uh, that dispute resolution, it's confidential between those two parties. And what the dispute resolution team is looking to do is where possible drive a, a good outcome and reach a conciliation. Now, when there's an investigation that's also happening in relation to the same matter, what we will do at the RTA is we will look to where possible have the dispute resolution matter resolved first. And the reason that we look to, to do that is so that the customers understand what part of the process they're in um, and that they're given the best opportunity to freely conciliate and reach a resolution before we commence that investigation. So the compliance and enforcement team may still investigate a matter, even if it has gone through a dispute resolution and even if the parties have reached an agreement. If one of those parties believes that there has been a breach of the legislation and they wish to have the matter investigated by the RTA, then we will still investigate that matter for them. The investigation um, does not rely on the information that was provided just during dispute resolution. That's a confidential um, process that goes through. So the party that um, submits an investigation request to the RTA will still need to go back through all that information they've given to the RTA previously in dispute resolution because the compliance and enforcement team will not receive that information. So essentially it is starting that, um, that information process to the RTA again. The compliance and enforcement team, our outcomes from an investigation are quite different to that from dispute resolution. Dispute resolution are looking to reach an outcome for both parties that's agreeable. A compliance and enforcement investigation 
Um, the outcomes for those are what I spoke about before. We might issue a notice of non-compliance if there's a breach, alternatively a penalty infringement notice, or the matter might end up um, uh, being prosecuted through the magistrate's court. Magistrate's court uh, for prosecutions is different to QCAT. So QCAT is uh, your civil administration tribunal. Uh, and the key word in that being civil, it is a magistrate's court, but it is civil. Um, prosecutions that happen through the compliance and enforcement team go through the local magistrate's court, but it's the criminal magistrate's court. All right. So well, thanks very much for all of that information, Stu. Um, I appreciate, uh, ladies and gents, we did say half an hour. Um, we're on time at the moment. Uh, we do have some questions. Um, so for those of you that can stick around, um, please do so. We will get this webinar up on our website within about a week. So um, if you do need to finish up, the, the last few bits of it will be included uh, in that recording. Stu, just uh, a question in relation to the statute of limitations. How far back does the RTA go? Uh, or, or can we go? In relation to taking enforcement action against an individual, if we're looking to issue a penalty infringement notice or a uh, commence a prosecution, there is a statute of limitations of two years um, from when the uh, offence has occurred, a maximum of two years, that is, um, until that statute runs out and, and we are unable to take those actions. No worries at all. Uh, and another question, uh, is anyone from the RTA checking online advertising as I keep seeing rental properties advertised by agencies without a fixed price? Yes, absolutely. We we monitor um, web websites as well. Uh, rent uh, that's not fixed uh, at, at a price, uh, especially through advertisement, is one of those key offences that we do look at and we do regularly regularly monitor those and we also have been taking enforcement action throughout this year specifically based off proactive activities that we have done in regards to what you're seeing online and if you do see that information online um, feel free to contact the rta and let us know excellent thanks for that uh, and from um, one of the attendees this morning Stu, given the legislation has been in place for minimum housing standards for nearly one year have we seen an increase in minimum housing standard issues? Our experience is that clear identification of property issues have not improved. Not sure from a compliance and enforcement. I mean, it, it, we get the end of the process, really, don't we? So we monitor the repair orders that come through uh, from QCAT. Now, a repair order may be in relation to a minimum housing standard, but it doesn't necessarily need to be. Uh, adjudicator or magistrate may grant a repair order uh, for a repair that doesn't that uh, isn't specifically in regards to that standard. We ensure that any repair order that comes through is properly monitored. Um, and we do have other avenues and pathways that um, have been shown during this presentation uh, where we will receive information about the state of a property and we will engage as well. All right. Well, thanks very much for filling us in there. Um, I've just uh, popped a, a message. If there are any last questions, uh, please pop them in. Um, but for, for now, that ends um, the information that, that we've got to share with you. Uh, we would encourage you um, to uh, look at um, our website, uh, sign up for our e-news, especially now with a lot of uh, changes coming from a legislative perspective. Um, we will keep uh, everyone that's uh, subscribed to our e-news updated with changes when they're starting, what they're, what's going on. Um, we also, uh, obviously, our webinars, anything um, that we produce is uh, available on uh, our website. So you can look back at, uh, at old webinars and podcasts as well. So um, stay tuned there. As I said, there will be um, plenty of information uh, about um, the uh, changes that are coming. Uh, one last quick question. How long are rental records to be kept? Depending on the rental record and depending on the type of tenancy agreement that it is, um, there the, generally as, as a rule, you're, you're looking at one year uh, from when a tenancy ends for a lot of documentation that's held um, in a tenancy to be kept, um, in particular rent receipts, um, entry condition reports. Uh, there, there's several different documents that you must keep for a minimum of one year after the tenancy ends. Bit difficult to break all those sections down quickly, um, but if you if you reach out to our contact centre, if you have a specific question about a specific document, they'd be um, able to assist you with that.
Fantastic. And speaking of our contact centre, uh, 1300 366 uh, is the number and they're available from 8.30 to 5, Monday to Friday. And as I mentioned before, um, follow us through any of those particular channels there. So uh, we do appreciate everyone um, jumping on today and staying with us. Uh, Stu, thanks very much for your insights today. Much appreciated. No worries at all. And ladies and gents, we will now end the webinar. Thank you. Thank you.